Um, but without further ado, I want to give a really, really um, warm welcome to Chuma Asakoro, who is our Power Hour speaker here today. Um, Chuma, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Chuma S. Okoro. Um, I'm here to deliver this presentation, Why Those Tech Companies Keep Rejecting You. So um, without further ado, let's get started. So quick introduction. Um, my name is Chuma S. Okoro. I'm a Nigerian American, born in Brooklyn, raised in Brooklyn. Um, I'm currently a software engineer. Um, currently software engineer level two at Amazon. Um, I'm also a tech writer. So um, I have a blog on Medium where I write different articles relating to tech, interviewing, resumes, things of that nature. So definitely check it out. And um, I'll have links in later on in the presentation. And I'm, I'm also a career coach and uh, I um, help people with their career, you know, with whether it's uh, doing mock technical interviews, helping them with their resume, or even if they're working on a side project, like a side technical project and they need a system design consult, um, I can also help with that as well. And um, I have links for that um, later on. So uh, here, so uh, yeah, my path uh, here, let me see, I see the chat. Um, yes, thank you everyone, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, quick background on my path into uh, software engineering. Uh, let's go. Okay, so uh, for me, it was, um, Maybe a somewhat common path, but um, a little bit of some hiccups here and there. Uh, basically, um, you know, I, I guess I, it goes back to high school. Um, I went to the Brooklyn Technical High School in New York City, which is, um, you know, more technical high school for like engineering and all that stuff. And um, there I did electromechanical engineering. So I kind of wet my feet into the whole technology space, was using different applications, not necessarily programming, but um was doing things with, um, you know, like, uh, I can't even remember the types of software, but um, things related to electric, uh, electronics, mechanics, um, you know, designing, um, using 3D printers and all of that stuff. Um, so when I went to Brooklyn College for my bachelor's degree, I was already thinking about, okay, technology, something to do with computers. So I naturally just chose computer science. And um, while I was at Brooklyn College, I was looking for ways to just honestly, honestly, just get paid. So I was looking at like different internships and things of that nature. I knew I knew how to use computers. So I was like, OK, maybe I could do something with like helping computers get set up. I had known this lady who um, so the, one of the first jobs I had in Brooklyn College was um, I was working with uh, with students after school and one of the students teachers. Um, worked for some uh, like Commission on Human Rights in New York City. And um, yeah, they worked for the Commission on Human Rights and they needed someone to help them move computers from one location to another. So I was like, okay, like I can do it. And I worked there as a, as a consultant for like a one, two day project that ballooned into like a two or three week project. And then they just hired me as like a consultant where I worked hourly, but um, pretty much was working 40 hours. But, 20 hours a week or so during the school year and then um, full time during the uh, during the summer. And I was doing IT to help desk type of type of work, um, computer setup, application setup, internet troubleshooting, all that stuff. Um, that helped me get my in, my uh, internship with Con Edison over the summer, where um, at Con Edison I was doing the exact same thing, information technology and all that. But um, while at the same time I'm doing this Con Edison thing, I'm also seeing, oh, um, like I'm doing programming classes as a part of my college curriculum. And I'm like, I wanna do this, like this programming stuff in my internship. I really don't care for this computer setup, IT setup, troubleshooting, networking. I really don't care for that. So I was having trouble and I was like, you know, I was like trying to get that to be my internship for the, um, the next summer but i was getting rejected from all of them and i was like what is going on like why are these companies not hiring me and i was like everyone i spoke to they were like oh yeah your resume is so good you work at con edison like you should have no problem but i'm like none of these companies like google won't give me an interview facebook won't give me an interview none of these companies would even give me an interview let alone me passing the interview 
So um, I had spoken to one person who was in the software engineering space, and um, they just took a look at my resume and basically tore it all up. Um, they were telling me like, yo, your resume doesn't really indicate that you have the talents to be a software engineer, um, let alone that I'm in a bachelor's degree, computer science program and all that. So um, that just goes to show you that even people with degrees still have trouble. It, you know, just because you have a degree in computer science or anything doesn't mean you're guaranteed a job. So, um, and that's, you know, I know something people kind of compare with, um, with the uh, boot camp background versus degree background. It's really about, do you present, do you have the skills? Um, so um, what I ended up doing in the information technology stuff, um, I quit Con Edison because um, they kept me on as a, I guess, intern fellow during the school year. And I started focusing solely on my um, software engineering like, career. So um, I bought this Udemy course so I could kind of figure out how to build like a web, a portfolio website of sorts, and also just do little, little um, knickknack projects with JavaScript, HTML, CSS. And then um, I did a whole bunch of networking. And I mean, like everywhere, like I was going to Code for Good Bootcamp uh, or Code for Good um, uh, Hackathon. I went to Columbia Hackathon. I went to like every hackathon I could find, every meetup I could find that... Um, you know, dealt with software engineering, technology. And, um, you know, I ended up meeting a whole bunch of people and was able to secure an internship um, somehow, some way, like maybe towards the end of the school year um, with MasterCard as a software engineer. And um, that internship, uh, it was in uh, Missouri. So it was taking a risk. So it was either go to Missouri for a summer or have no software engineering internship. So I did it and um, yeah. After I did that MasterCard internship, it opened up a whole bunch of doors for me. Um, MasterCard gave me a return offer, but then I also wanted to get other companies and you know look at what else I could do with that um, for full time after I graduated. So from there, um, I did this like side program with CUNY Tech Prep, which is kind of like a boot camp, but for CUNY college students, and um, that helped a lot with me my interviewing skills and. Um, I did a lot of the same stuff I was doing on my own, but as a part of this entity uh, called CUNY Tech Prep, which is really, really impactful towards my career. And, um, you know, toward, I ended up getting a good amount of, a whole bunch of failures, like more failures than, you know, you might believe. Um, I applied to hundreds and hundreds of companies and um, you know, I maybe got four or five job offers and I ended up going with Etsy, um, that's my first full-time job out of college. And then um, from Etsy, I was there for 2.7-ish years. I got one promotion, one almost promotion. Uh, I would have been made senior software engineer at Etsy, but I decided to make a move to Amazon to be a, a software engineer level two. And um, I've been at Amazon since January, and um, I'm liking it so far. So that's... Uh, Boiled down, that's my um, whole timeline on how I got to where I am today. Uh, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so reasons, back to the initial question on why those uh, tech companies keep rejecting you. So um, here, here are the reasons. Um, little, you know, little uh, joke right here, um, but uh, for those of you who watch The Office, but um, the first reason I might say is uh, gatekeeping, right? And I'll say this because um, really a lot of, and this is really with any industry, most industries, um, people like to hire who they know, who they already know, who they already know and trust. And this, you know, Amazon's like this, Etsy's like this, every company is like this, right? If, if I'm someone hiring for a role and I know two people, one person, I, you know, met them at a networking event, and, you know, I know that they have some skills versus a random resume that I got off of LinkedIn. Which person am I going to consider first? Probably that person that I already know, met, and all that stuff. So I know gatekeeping maybe has, it definitely has a bad connotation, but um, I think it's um, something that, you know, just comes with the game. It comes with, you know, the industry and really any industry where, you know, people who you Knowing someone, it's it's who you know, not what you know. So um, that's um a big part of you know why you might not be getting those uh, 
you know, they're why the, those tech companies might, might be rejecting you. Um, second reason I would say is um, lack of experience. So um, sure, you know, you know someone, you know, let's say you know me or whatever, let's say you know a recruiter or hiring manager or just a, engineer, an individual contributor at a company and, you know, they want to give you a um, referral, right? I remember when I was at Etsy, I tried to put in so many referrals and I didn't get too many of them in. And the reason why I couldn't get a lot of referrals in for even an interview is because of lack of experience. Oftentimes, similar to my situation when I was at Con Edison doing IT, your resume doesn't indicate that you have the skills to even pass an interview, right? And that's what really these companies are doing when they're taking people in for interviews. They only take people in for interviews that they think can pass their interview, right? So um, how, why, why might someone think you could pass their interview if maybe you have certain technologies on your resume that let them know, okay, they have certain skills, like they know how to program in Python, they know um, their tree and graph data structures, they know this, this, and that. So um, uh, yeah, lack of experience on, you know, depicted on your resume or LinkedIn or wherever um, might be a reason why these tech companies keep rejecting you. Um, let's see, third reason is um, the interview, right? So um, you can get the interview. Finally, you're at a place, your resume is on point, you networked, you know everyone, you know the gatekeepers, all that. You can get into an interview and then you go to the interview and boom, you bomb it. Well, why is that? Well, I mean, some of these tech technical interviews can be pretty tricky. And um, I've had my fair ex experience of bombing interview, or not bombing interviews, but failing interviews, where um, basically you just don't get a call back or you get a call back and they're like, oh, we're sorry, but right now you're not the right fit for the role. They won't give you feedback, all that annoying stuff. But um, it, it's a part of the game. You have to prepare for these interviews, right? It's one thing to get an interview. And at a certain point in your career, you'll be able to get an interview with pretty much any company. But then it's another thing to pass the interview, which you know requires preparation, which requires practice, all that stuff. Um, and we'll share some, I'll share some stuff later on on how to do that. But um passing the interview is a big part of it. And um, if you're not preparing for the interview, then that might be a reason why you're um why you keep getting rejected. Last reason I would say is luck. Um, luck definitely plays a part in it. Um, the type of interviewer you get, um, how many maybe hints they give you, um, how much, um, you know, how optimal of a solution, like do you get them during the morning right after their coffee or do you get them in the evening when they're tired and sluggish after dinner, you know, all that stuff that plays a role into it, because I know there's definitely and maybe this is just the skeptic in me. I know there's definitely been times where I maybe did well in an interview, but, you know, for whatever reason, like maybe they were having a bad day or whatever. I just the luck wasn't just in my was just not in my favor that day. So, um, you know, I think luck might be, a, you know, I, I won't say it's a huge part, but I think it's a small part of um, why you might not do good on an interview, even if with the type of question you get. Maybe you over-prepared in graphs, trees, and um, linked lists, but you didn't prepare too much with, um, I don't know, arrays, right? And then you end up just so happen to getting an array problem on your interview instead of a graph problem on your interview. You know, I mean, that a little bit of that is luck. You know, one could say, okay, you should prepare for everything, which is true, but, a little bit of luck, you know, going in your favor. Maybe they ask you a question that you're already familiar with the general um, problem solving techniques around it. That can help a lot. And not having that luck in your favor can be a potential reason why you keep getting rejected. But um, there, there was a saying, uh, basically, people who, you know, work hard, get lucky more often. So there's something like that. Um, but uh, basically, um, you can do the luck won't matter the more interviews you do the more pre preparation you want you do the more networking you have so um yeah that's my take on all that and um yeah let's move on some remedies to that so uh how could we fix that let's see so um 
लोग सो हाउ डू वी फिक्स दिस वो वन थिंग आई वुड से इज नेटवर्क एंड आई पुट इट थ्री टाइम्स नेटवर्क 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 बिकॉज आई रियली डू थिंक दिस इज वन ऑफ द बिगेस्ट पार्ट्स of the hiring interviewing process um you can prepare you can practice you can do side projects all that but if you don't know the right people you just won't get as many opportunities as someone who's out there networking and doing all this um even me you know for example using linkedin um uh, that's a huge networking tool that um many people use and like for myself i personally don't even like when i got into amazon I didn't even apply. They um they reached out to me and they just saw my LinkedIn and you know they saw my information and I put I set my LinkedIn up such that it's easy for someone to contact me. And um same thing with um with Alex uh uh he reached out to me on LinkedIn. So networking is huge whether it's in person via hackathons, meetups, conferences, things of that nature or virtually via social media like network like uh LinkedIn. So um I'd say this is a huge key thing that many people um try to forego and you know they might say things like oh I'm shy or whatever but um you know it's still something that I think everyone should have in their tool belt even if they if it's a small part of it like you don't even have to be posting frequently on LinkedIn but at least having you know some information about yourself like okay I'm a software engineer New York City area and i'm looking for roles and you kind of say what type of skills you have maybe you do those little linkedin tests all that stuff helps uh side projects um that's a big one um i think side projects so for me when i was um back you know reverse back to that time when i was at con edison and i wasn't able to get software engineering companies to reach out to me for internships um to call me back for an internship that I applied for um I didn't really have much software engineering specific experience so um I did things like Udemy where I so I could um work on little side projects and I could at least put that on my resume not only Udemy working on my own things but um going to hackathons hackathons are, are great because they kind of hit two birds with one stone it hits the networking aspect where you're in an environment with a whole bunch of tech not tech minded people who are in the exact same industry as you but also you can do a project at a hackathon and those are even those are honestly the best projects in my opinion to have in your resume something you did at a hackathon because one you did them not because you were paid to do it but just because you have genuine interest in whatever you're doing and two it's like you're you know you're dedicating your free time to go do this thing so um i know i've noticed that when i'm talking to people um whether in an interview or in a networking session and i bring up a project i did at a hackathon it always gets me good looks like you know when i went to jp morgan's code for good they were like oh word like you you did code for good okay what's your project and then if you if you just so happen to win one of those hackathons even better so um definitely side projects are huge to supplement lack of real working experience whether internship experience or full time experience uh last part is uh practice uh hold on let me look at the chat real quick these memes are quality yes thank you um yeah so practice Prac you cannot you know you must do practice you must practice um for interviews um you know when i was uh, back in college i probably interviewed with at least 50 companies at least 50 companies and you know i was when i and when i say like i was really interviewing like i was hitting those technical assessments i was doing the um the screen call call screenings i was traveling to different states whenever i would get like an on site whether it's san francisco texas utah all these different places to do interviews and i was practicing you know i had cracking the coding interview um back in the days when i you know i was in Brooklyn college and um also leak code is huge and um and um, there's one other platform uh pramp where i would do mock technical interviews but also i would do mock technical interviews with my friends like on whiteboards actually I have a whiteboard in my place now um 
where I would just practice problems because um, you have to practice because a lot of these questions that you get on these interviews, they're not even new questions. Like they might paint it out to seem a little bit new, but like a lot of them will have the same underlying concepts. Like, uh, you know, for example, if you get a graph question, chances are it's going to have depth first search or breadth first search somewhere in there. So if you're someone who's never done a breadth first search, depth first search question before, and you get some new, some, you know, made up question that involves breadth first search or depth first search, you'll have a really hard, difficult time dealing with it as opposed to someone who has done 20 breadth first search, depth first search graph type problems and can instantly recognize, oh, okay, this person is asking about I don't know, number of islands that are connected to each other and blah, blah, blah. That's a depth first search or that's a depth first search type of question. So um, definitely doing practice is huge. It lets you recognize, pick up quickly on the common algorithms, common data structures, and um, you just feel more comfortable and at ease when you're in an interview. Um, if you're, you know, first time doing an interview, you're going to be tense. You're going to be like, oh, oh my gosh, I, I hope I answered this correctly. Versus someone who's done 20 of them, 50 of them, all that, um, they're going to be so much more at ease. And one thing I'll say for myself, and, uh, you know, I, I'll, this is, I've seen people have success in different ways, right? For myself, I'm the type of person, which is, you know, maybe you could say this is a fault, but um, I'll maybe fail a lot. And then from each of those failures, I'll get, get learn more. And then eventually I'll start passing a lot. Right. And that's kind of always been my route. Like um, when I was in college, I did, I had a bunch of failed interviews and then from each one I learned. And then later on, I, I started passing a whole bunch of interviews back to back because I had all that context from the failed ones that, you know, helped me learn. Same thing happened uh, last year when I was looking at um, making a move from Etsy. I, you know, I had probably like four final round interviews with, you know, top tech companies, Bloomberg, Palantir, Two Sigma. Um, all that Apple, and then, you know, didn't do too well in the final rounds, but each one was like preparation for the next ones. So then I, you know, I passed a, a couple of um, final round interviews and Amazon was one of those companies and I decided to go with it. So um, that's one approach. The other approach, and, you know, I know some people from college, like there was this one girl I know I knew from college who, um, you know, we were in the same, I think like, I don't know, algorithms class or something like that. And um, she was doing um, her interview prep. And I remember with her, she didn't really, she didn't interview as much as me, but she just prepared. She just, you know, practiced, 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 took notes, all that stuff, like she was doing for a test. And then she scheduled like maybe one, two, maybe three interviews. And then she just did, did great on pretty much all of them. So she didn't do as much um, real practice with actual tech companies, but she just practiced on her own and then only when she was really, really prepared did she go to, and she actually, um, she passed Google's interview and um, she got full-time offer from Google when she when we were in college. So she, she, she started working at Google right after. So um, I think that's another approach and a really good approach as well. Um, maybe don't do so many interviews and use those interviews to practice, 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 and then go for that one company that you're really solid about and just do great on that one. I think each approach works um, for different people. I think for me on my end, um, it was a little bit like I got the most value out of preparing with a real interview because I felt the stakes were a little bit higher. So I you know, went into it with more effort as opposed to if I'm just preparing on my own. But um, the other one worked, the other route works as well. So, you know, and you know, probably you could argue that it um, saves more time to prepare, 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 maybe prepare for two months before doing one interview that you're really solid about and then doing lights out on that. So to each his own, but um, yeah, that's my, my opinion on that. Uh, let's see, on to the next. Okay, oh, hold up, let's see this chat. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, we will have a Q&A and a resources slide right now. So um, resources. So here are a few of the resources that um, I put together. Um, Leak code, cracking coding interview. Um, here's a link for mock technical interviews where you can schedule one-on-one -on -one with me to do a mock technical interview. 
uh, technical interview structures, um, this doc that I put together on how my opinion on how, uh, or my, uh, let me not say that. Um, this technical interview structure is um, a doc I put together on the, um, since I've done so many interviews, what I've seen as like a common thread between most of the interviews. Um, structuring your resume, a doc I put together on how, um, my opinion on how best to structure your resume. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had, you know, recruiters from, you know, whatever company look at this, whether it's Bloomberg, where they're writing all my resume, like, where are the numbers, like quantitative data. So um, I talk a little bit about that in the structuring your resume document. Um, Twitter folks have spoken about it, all sorts of folks. System design interviewing. This is, um, this might be a, vi yes, I think this is a video put out by Amazon and um, a recruiter shared it with me when I was in the interview process to um, for SD2 role at Amazon. And I think I watched this interview, this video by Amazon maybe two days before my interview with Amazon, my final round interview with Amazon. And when I say the structure of Amazon's system design interview was exactly like that video like to the t so um i would highly recommend that um i know maybe sd1 might not get a system design interview but sd2 and up will definitely get that so um i think it's just useful to watch it um just for your own knowledge and all that uh networking um here's a linkedin profile this is my linkedin profile but um you can see other recommended linkedin profiles with similar backgrounds to me um, when you click on mine. And um, I just wanted to share because um, I think my LinkedIn profile could give you a good gist of the type of profile that maybe people or recruiters might want to reach out to. Um, as I've seen before, like once you get your experience and LinkedIn profile to a certain um, way, um, recruiters will just reach out to you because I mean, LinkedIn is one of the biggest online resources that recruiters use to source candidates. So, um, you know, if your LinkedIn profile shows your talents and all that, then you won't really, you can focus your worries on the actual resident on your interview as opposed to getting an interview. Uh, meetups, this is um, a good um, little resource uh, where I was um, basically, I did a lot of meetups when I was uh, in college and still do a couple here and there um, to this day, um, like earlier this year, I went to one meetup called New York Coding Coffee. And um, I went to it, it was a really cool experience. And, um, you know, there were other people in the industry um, at that meetup too. There were Amazon engineering managers there. I saw, you know, people from different companies that were there um, actually recruiting and actually looking for people to um, put through the pipeline. So um, meetups are really cool. You can meet other like-minded people who are also looking, share tips, tricks, work on projects together, all that stuff. And hackathons. Um, I'm a huge advocate for hackathons because you hit that two birds, one stone. You work on it, you get a project that you've built in order to achieve a goal, which is win a prize. And also you get networking at the exact same time. So hackathons, I'm a huge advocate for Many projects, you know, they might take weeks or months or whatever to really get somewhere with, with it. But with a hackathon, it's a one day, two day effort and you complete the project right then and there. You, I mean, not complete, but you get to a minimum viable product and you can, for right after that hackathon, you can talk about it with other people. Like, oh yeah, I did this. I set up, you know, a server and I created, you know, two lambdas or blah, blah, blah. Like you can really, um, hackathons are really useful to um, increasing, adding to your resume and um, increasing your network. Okay, uh, any questions? Awesome, thank you, Chuma. Yeah, now's the perfect time for questions, obviously. Um, I, if you don't mind, I want to start with my own before we open it up to uh, everyone else. It usually takes them a little bit of time to get the courage to raise their hand. Um, I noticed in your early career, um, you know, when you uh, were internship, uh, doing internships, you got several return offers, um, right? You uh, were kept on uh, as a fellow at Con Ed. You um, 
there were a couple of instances, I think at MasterCard, you got a return offer. How did you, how, how did that work out? Because I know that that's actually a really common way to get like a permanent role. You know, you start out somewhere as like maybe a contractor or just working on a small project or maybe an internship. How did, how did you manage to really turn those into more lengthy projects or lengthy contracts to get that return offer? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, really, how, how did I do that? Um, I would say I just... Uh, like I did my job. Uh, I think that's really like, um, you know, when you when you get in, into an internship, a lot of people might want to, um, here, let me just put this link in the chat. Um, a lot of people might want to just, um, okay, coast and slack off or whatever. But um, I kind of went into it with the mindset of like, I need to make sure that I do the best possible job I can do here. And also, also prove my case to, um, the company. So I'm like actually letting them know, like I did this much, this much, this much. And maybe, you know, I think sometimes in like the business world, having a little bit of a quote unquote ego helps because if you don't advocate for yourself, no one else will. So um, it's all even on my LinkedIn profile where I, um, if you go through the archives of my documents and stuff like that, I have the, my end of year presentation that I did at MasterCard where basically I was just like, you know, patting myself on the back saying, oh, I did this, I did that. I was so productive. I, you know, did so many things to help this company, made y'all money, blah, 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 blah. So, um, you know, being able to, you know, add value and express how you did that, I think really helps for um, getting into these, uh, getting return offers from these uh, top tech companies. That communication and, um, yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was also really cool to hear that you went to NYC uh, Code and Coffee. We actually uh, sponsor some of their events. We've welcomed them into our campus here in New York. And we even ended up offering a few of their uh, participants free scholarships to our boot camps um, on, uh, you know, as an impact you know, scholarship basis. So really cool to see the connection. They're a really cool group. And there's very equally you know, been uh, cool meetups all over North America and, you know, across the world. So definitely encourage everyone to participate. Find the one that makes sense for you. Some are really big. I like NYC Code and Coffee is pretty large. Um, some are a little bit more intimate. Um, and it's really just helpful to find the one that makes sense for you. Um, I think we have a question um, or comment from Sophia. Uh, she says, thank you for sharing your story and advice. As a side note, it's interesting hearing about the amount of rejections that you've experienced from the demand uh, despite the demand of software developers, you know, being high. Um, do, uh, I'm going to build off of that and ask you, like, did, it sounds like you have a network of other software developers that you know. Um, is, is that common to get that many rejections um, as you're starting out? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, rejection is almost like common in the software engineering space because, um, even though there's a lot of uh, uh, demand for software developers, each company has their own standards and each company wants to do their own vetting process, right? So let's say you know how to, you know, you've developed apps, like I was at Etsy, right? That's a you know pretty established company and all that. Um, every company after that wants to do their own thing. They want to determine, oh, okay, how good are you really? You know, so um, then you have to re-interview, you have to re-demonstrate your skills, all that stuff. And um, yeah, like if you maybe, you know, get one, get like, you know, one, do, do not too, not as optimal on an interview as maybe you have a chance to demonstrate it. And then, you know, if you don't do well on it, then it, uh, you know, you get rejected. So um it can be, you know, like I've spoken with friends about it who are in the team. They'll tell me about a story that, you know, they had with some company where they really thought they did good and they were just demoralized after they got that rejection. And, um, but one thing about all the people I know who have gotten to where they want to be, um, they kept, you know, they kept working through it and um, they didn't let that one company that, you know, rejected them. Uh, stop them from still trying to do better. So, um, yeah, um, it's it's very common, and um, but don't let it uh, hurt your ego. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's pretty universal in the tech industry. Uh, but the most important thing, as Truman pointed out, is really just to learn from the failures. And they're not even failures, right? Like it, it's yes. they're just reactions to that one particular role, that one particular company. Um, you know, and you can learn from it and turn it into a success. Um, and Truman, I, I know you were talking yep. a lot about the hackathons and the value, and I completely agree. It's really, really beneficial to have that project like in your you know, uh, portfolio and to network at the same time. Um, how did you, when you started going to hackathons, how did you find the right way to contribute um, to a hackathon? So you really felt like, you know, you're walking away with something that you can talk about during an interview. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when I would go to hackathons, a lot of the hackathons I went to, I went by myself. So um, I met a random team there. And then um, usually towards the beginning of a hackathon, you know, we'll be deciding what we want to build and type of stack. And then you'll kind of, we'll each talk about our own individual skills, maybe something that we want to work on. And then um, one thing I like, there were de there's definitely hackathons where I felt like I didn't really contribute as much as I would have liked, but the ones that I did, I was able to contribute, um, contribute um, the way I liked. Uh, what I did towards the beginning was kind of define out what are each of, each of our tasks, right? So it wasn't, even if there was one person who was like, you know, really smart, they knew what they were doing, they worked with all the cool technologies before, I would make it be clear, like, okay, what part are you doing versus what part am I doing? Are you working on this and this server endpoint versus me working on this and this React component or whatever? Like, um, having those clearly defined roles, okay, this person is working on a database, this person is working on the presentation, you know, having that. Um, very defined from the beginning was, um, I would say, it was a big way on how to get what I wanted, wanted in terms of um, uh, actionable things that I contributed to a project during a hackathon. And we got a question from Timo. He's asking, um, you know, is it okay to show up and not have a ton of coding experience at a hackathon? Totally. Um, the first hackathon I went to, I didn't have a ton of uh, I had coding experience, but not project building experience, um, which I think is very different. Um, like I didn't know all the cool fangled technologies like React, no, no blah, blah, blah. So um, really I just came in saying, okay, I know this language, I know that. And um, like I presented what I knew. And then usually, hopefully you have someone on the team who is a little bit more familiar with um, you know creating something and then they just carve out a niche for you specifically. Um, so yeah, I would say it's definitely okay. But then each additional hackathon you go to, because I'm not recommending only one, I'm recommending go to a couple, two, three, four, whatever. Each additional hackathon, you'd hope that you're gaining more and more skills such that you can already say, oh, this is what I can contribute. Um, you know, can we carve out a role for me? Or maybe it's, okay, in this case, you don't need my particular skills. Maybe I can learn a new skill. And you know, watch some tutorials and contribute in this um, this new space. So, um, car making that explicit from the beginning. But yeah, no coding experience, not a big deal. Um, you can get that, and you will get some project experience here as a bootcamp student. Um, I know the July cohort. I'm going to give a shout out to them because they just completed last week their hackathon that was that we uh, brought in uh, the WNBA for as our industry partner. And the WNBA presented a problem statement, one that they're currently actually trying to figure out. And, you know, we put students together in groups and this is some uh, to create a solution for that problem statement. And you have 24 hours to build something right and then directly present it to the WNBA, you know, so we are, we will have a similar project for the August cohort um, that's in here as well. So you definitely will be able to leave this boot camp with that hackathon style ex experience and something to put into your portfolio. Um, I know I've, uh, Daniel, please go ahead with your question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation, Chuma, uh, and sharing your journey. I think there's a lot of takeaways just from there. Um, my question, um, you mentioned that you're a big advocate for personal projects. Um, and I think it can be very overwhelming in terms of what kind of tech stack or just generally like what kind of project ideas to work on. So for instance, um, 
is it better to just concentrate on the things you already know? So for example, if you feel comfortable with React, should you build personal projects with something that you want to show off that you know well, or is it better to use personal projects as an opportunity to show off that you can learn new things um, and maybe pick up new tech? Any, any advice on that side of things? Really good question. Um... I think personal projects can be, um, they can serve both purposes. Um, like recently I wanted to like, maybe earlier this year, I wanted to work on this new project with a new technology. And I was like, I wanna build something with um, this database, Alexandria, some, something like that. I don't remember exactly what it was. So um, that's something I'll do even now, like as a hobby, like I'm like, I wanna kind of learn how to use this and um, I'll kind of just think of a project to um, work on this new technology, right? Um, so I think that works, but also I would say um, for, especially for people who are like just kind of getting started, trying to uh, beef up their resume, I think you should build something with something you already know, because um, I remember a senior engineer told me this once when I first started my career, they were like, depth is way better than breadth for entry-level engineers, because, um, you know, there's, it happens all the time, like especially when you go to hackathons and stuff like that. You meet people who you know know a little bit about everything. Like, oh yeah, they know a little bit of React, they know a little bit of Angular, they know a little bit of uh, Spring Boot, whatever. They know a little bit of everything, but they're not really good at any one particular thing. So um, I'd say depth is better than breadth when you're first getting started. So um, really knowing one thing well, I would say will help you the best. Um, so if you if you've done some stuff with React, let's say um, BrainStation teaches you React, do a personal project with React. Maybe build your own website or do um, I don't know. Like there's a whole bunch of ideas out there. You know, make a Instagram a copy of Instagram or you know something like that. Um, and you know, call it your own thing and host it and you know just do go through the motions of building something. Um, don't worry too much about the technology. Like really the technology doesn't matter too much. Like oftentimes, like I talk to recruiters, um, even now, like, you know, I might talk to a recruiter and they say, um, oh, okay, so what's your tech stack? And I'm like, oh, I, I don't really know what my tech stack is because I've worked with so many different tech stacks. It really depends on the problem, right? So at Amazon, there's no one thing that we use here, um, at least not on my team. Um, sometimes I might be writing some Java, in a Lambda, sometimes I might be writing um, some Python. I might be doing some front-end HTML, blah, 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 blah. Like, it really depends on what needs to be done. And that will determine what the tech stack is. So for you, I wouldn't worry too much about what tech stack should be. I would worry about just doing something, right? So it could be you're doing something to learn something new, or it could be you're doing something to, um, uh, to uh, develop an existing skill but just do something. Don't worry too much about the tech stack, what language to learn, all that stuff. Because chances chances are, whatever company you start at, they're gonna have their own type of technologies and tech stack anyways, right? I started at Etsy and um, they interviewed me in like what, JavaScript and something else. And I ended up using PHP for the most of my job, 2.7 years there. And I never used PHP before that. You know, I was mainly Java, C++, all that stuff. And um, I used PHP there. Now I'm at Amazon, um, you know, I, I use some Java, I use some Python, but um, most of my job isn't necessarily coding. Like I'm working with uh, AWS tools a lot and I've you know, never really used AWS tools like that before, but pretty much everything that Amazon, at Amazon is AWS. So um, there's that. If you go to Google, it might be Google Cloud Services. If you go to Facebook, they have their own stuff. So don't worry too much about the technology. Yeah, really good response. I actually, uh, we recently had a speaker come in uh, to our campus. He's a senior, I'm um, sorry, um, engineering manager at Google. And, you know, he got a question that was really similar to that. And his response was really just show that you're good at something. Right. Mm -hmm. And his, his opinion as a hiring manager, he's oftentimes, you know, growing teams within Google. His response is like, if I can see from your application or your interview that you're really good at something, chances are you're going to be able to be good at the thing that we need you to be good at. Right. So just mm -hmm. show me that. Right. Um, and actually, it's yeah, really I totally nice agree with that. that. 
that you mentioned Etsy, um, we got a question from uh, Grazi asking just, you know, what was that the transition into that first, you know, big tech job like, you know, uh, coming in from like internships and, and self learning and hackathons? Um, how do how what was the kind of the initial process like of getting adjusted to that type of environment? Yeah, um, it was a, uh, it was, um, it was definitely an adjustment. Um, I, uh, I done so when I was in college, I did do a good amount of internships, um, but um, I, I think Etsy was most similar to my um, internship at JustWorks because JustWorks was a startup, and Etsy still had very startup y vibes. Um, in that you know they had all the you know startup y niceties like uh, you know, coffee, free food, all that stuff, but um, also it was um very collaborative environment and, um, you know, very engineering driven, um, engineering group driven. So, um, yeah, I would say that, um, how difficult was it? It wasn't, um, I, uh, from my in past internships, I need to have, you know, very good communication with my manager. So, um, Focusing on that made it such that I was able to onboard pretty quickly because I basically just, you know, listened to my manager and, um, you know, I would ask certain questions about my manager, like, okay, like, you know, uh, what, what are your expectations of me? Like, what, um, how can I, and also in my mind, like my mindset, when I joined Etsy, I was like, okay, I want to get a promotion. So, and I was like, All right, I have internship. I was like, a little bit of ego was involved in it, you know, admittedly. But um, I was like really like asking my manager, like, what can I, I'm trying to be better. What can I do? What can I do? Let me know. Let me know. Um, so um, they were just like saying, okay, like we need you to focus on doing one piece really well, like individually contributing, you know, doing an individually scoped out task. Okay. From there, uh, how can you, you know, scope out a task for other people to work on? Okay. From there. And I just, at each point, I was asking, what can I do to be better? And then doing what they told me to do. And um, eventually, really towards the end of the year, they put me up. So I joined in June of 2019. In December, they put me up for promotion. I didn't get it in December. But then um, in the next summer, they gave me the promotion. So um, really, um, it was um, it was difficult in the sense that... Um, it was, you know, first full-time job and, you know, expectations and all that. But um, I was really excited to do it and I enjoyed the work. So um, I wouldn't say it was so much, so difficult. Um, working with experienced developers, hmm, that part, I might say um, that, that could be frustrating sometimes because sometimes like you get critiques and like if you have ego, you're just like, what? how could they say this? Like, you know, you put out a, a pull request and they give you all this feedback and you're just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know my code was so bad or whatever. But um, I think it can be good. You learn a lot, um, not being so closed off to hearing good advice from other people. Um, there was one senior engineer, he was like probably the smartest engineer I've ever worked with. But um, on every pull request I put out, he just gave me like, he went in on every pull request and I came to expect it. And I really enjoy it. And um, really, when you get when working with an experienced developer, the best situation you could have is an it, it is an experienced developer while you're an entry level developer who cares enough to give you feedback. Because really, when you're in the industry, a lot of times, experienced developers they're not going to say anything to you. They're not. They're going to like pretend you're not even there or whatever. They're not going to give you that feedback because they're like, oh, I don't want to offend you. Blah 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 blah. And then you end up not really growing from it. But um, when I was at Etsy, there's this one, I mean, there were a few, but um, specifically there's one I'm thinking of who would give me some really good feedback, critical feedback. And um, it would be like, I really, I felt like I grew so much just from having his advice on my pull request. Oh, you should think about this structure of code versus this one, blah, blah, blah. And eventually I started doing it back to him. And like, we would like kind of grow from that because, you know, Whenever we needed some, like we were unsure about our own code, like, hmm, I need another set of eyes on it. We would send it to each other. So I would send him mine, like, could you let me know what you think about this? I was, you know, blah, 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 thinking about this. And then he would do the same thing with me. And then I, you know, give him my feedback. I try to come with it with a different approach and all that, like give him a little 
an interesting take. So um, yeah, the, um, there might be pressure working with experienced developers, but once you get comfortable, know that people, you know, especially if they're giving you feedback, 100% of the time, if they're giving you feedback on your pull requests, because managers are not usually looking at pull requests. Pull requests and code reviews are usually between engineers. If they're giving you good like feedback, they're being critical, take it as a good thing, not a bad thing. Because a bad thing would be they're not giving you any feedback and they're letting you make your own mistakes and then you just make mistakes and they go to production and you're just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? When an engineer, an experienced engineer could have told you, oh, you should maybe check this out. I think you're doing this wrong or whatever. Yeah, thank you so much for the really detailed answers. Um, please, we, have, we don't have a lot of time left. So if you do have questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, or post it in the chat. Otherwise, uh, all the time is gonna be dominated by, by me asking my silly questions. Um, I did want to ask, you know, since you're, you're mentioning pull requests and, and getting feedback, um, I'm going to talk about the bane of every developer's uh, existence, um, documentation. How, how did, you know, did you get onboarded to documentation? Um, is that something you just picked up along the way? Um, how important did you find that it was um, in, in your, you know, onboarding with Etsy? And then, you know, did it help you become a better developer over time? to write my own documentation or to read other people's documentation? Both, both. Yeah, um, documentation is like a godsend. Um, if someone creates documentation and you can rely on that, then uh, it can make your job a lot easier because you don't have to do your own debugging or trying to figure something out because um, they already basically put the answers out there for you. Um, at Etsy, they had um, really good documentation. Um, so um, that was um, very fortunate. And then for myself with creating documentation, that's like a must do, um, especially for if you wanna level up in your career, because documentation is like written proof that you did something, right? Whereas like you could, you know, put your pull requests out and all that, but no one's gonna read your code, but your manager will look at your documentation. Let's say you do a system design, right? If you have, if, if promotion time comes and they're like, oh, we need to see all the impactful things that you've done as an engineer. Well, you can actually link them. Oh, I did this system design doc in this time. I did this documentation to document my system and the metrics. At this time I did, you know, and you can actually pull the receipts. So your, your docs, think of your docs for, at least from your perspective of writing them as your receipts of um, good things that you've done. Um, not only that, they are, um, really good ways to help other people, which is, um, you know, you want to do that, um, especially for promotions and all that. Helping other people is a huge sign um, that you're, you know, ready for the next level. So um, does that, does, docs are helpful for doing that as well. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, depending on the company, it might be more important, less important. Um, so yeah, there are definitely times where I could do more like, okay, maybe in my current role, I haven't been doing as much documentation externally because it's very fast paced and you know, deadlines and all that stuff. So certain things may go to the wayside when you are, um, uh, when you're you know, working really fast versus, um, versus others. So let's say I'm working on, on a big project and it's due at the end of the month, right? I might not be able to do my documentation you know, before the end of the month if I wanna get it out. Um, I still want to do it eventually because it's not only is it good for the team um, as a whole to have documentation about a particular system, but it's good for you as well. But um, so yeah, that's that's my that's my take on it um, for both writing and um, reading documentation. Thank you. Um, and, and Chris had the question actually about you know the the sort of economic downturn and and for us the you know more relevant issue is you know the potential hiring freezes that are happening across the tech industry. Um, and, you know, do you think it's a dire situation and do you have any advice for, you know, how we can, you know, get through it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, is it a dire situation? I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I don't know the numbers of people who are um, applying to and, you know, ready for a tech job versus the amount of openings they have. I think that there are a lot of openings right now. Like I know Amazon, for example, they're like dying to get new engineers. 
but um it might it might be the case that it, those are for more mid-level senior engineers or whatever but um there's definitely openings right now and yeah there are hiring freezes at certain companies but there are still openings at many other companies so um i would say that um how does it affect the hiring rate um yeah i mean it might slow down the hiring rate but um there are still going to be companies that need people like banks are going to need people like even in during a recession there's still certain businesses that will be profitable and you know want to want to take advantage of that um take it like let's say google has a hiring freeze amazon is going to want to take advantage of it or let's say a company has 20 percent. like what company had layoffs recently um some company shopify. had layoffs shopify right and um, I remember I saw on LinkedIn, like, and people at Amazon were like, oh, all you Shopify people, Uber people who um, who got laid off, come work at Amazon and we'll offer you this, this and that. So um, I think um, when, uh, you know, and, you know, there are certain companies that um, are maybe worse positioned for down downtimes, um, you know, whether they have uh, too much debt or they're not profitable there are other companies that are doing better for that um, that type of environment. Who, that, a company that might have cash flows, a company that might have um, uh, a reduced headcount and have have gone the slow growth way as opposed to the fast growth with high debt um, way and low low profits, such that they can um, just grow quickly. So um, I think it depends. But um, for you, I would I wouldn't even worry about that. I would just worry about increasing your skill set and applying and getting networking and getting the job don't worry too much about the macro stuff yeah i completely agree and just a reminder that even if there is a hiring freeze at a particular company hiring freezes are always momentary they are temporary measures um and it is no excuse to not do all the other things that you could be doing right the networking the projects that's the perfect time to be able to do that stuff build connections keep applying um never never rest just because of a hiring freeze um well i think that's all the time we have i want to be respectful of truma's time because you know middle of the day i'm sure we all have things to get back to um thank you so much truma again really really appreciate your very detailed responses and your really helpful presentation um again i think that this uh group of students in particular are going to be benefiting a lot from everything you just mentioned so thank you again so much for giving us some of your time Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate um, you creating the time for me. Yeah. Um, and if anyone here has a follow up question, I, I think Chum is open to connecting on LinkedIn. So uh, feel free to reach out uh, on there. Yeah, right. Yes, um, definitely do that. Um, I did a presentation in the channel in the chat. So um, definitely check it out. Um, and uh, you feel free to you know, look at the links and all that. But um, thank you, everyone. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all.